All right. <laughs> so thank you very much, and thank you very much to uh, obviously Chris for helping organize all these things, the Sister School Society of Australia, and to ASINS. It's I'm really looking forward to all the interactions I'm going to have in Australia, and I've already enjoyed many uh, interactions so far. So I'm going to give a talk, which is basically like a tutorial on sequential Monte Carlo methods in statistics. Um, I hope I, I hope it's interesting. A lot of it is at, uh, at a, as low level as, as possible, but of course it does assume a little bit of familiarity with Monte Carlo integration and so on. Okay, so as the introduction, I'll just start off. It's mainly for setting a bit of notation, a little bit about classical Monte Carlo, which is a method for approximating um, intractable integrals or sums. Uh, and I'll look at important sampling, and from that point, we can then go on to the sequential Monte Carlo methods, and in particular, um, look at them as uh, ways to solve certain problems in the context of hidden Markov models, which are very commonly uh, used uh, throughout the natural sciences and also in industry in some, in some cases. Okay, and from there, that's the, so the last three points are bits where it's a, like slightly more advanced, but hopefully, I'm not going to go into too much detail. I'm hoping that sort of it gives a sort of taste of the kind of things that people have been doing more recently to try and improve the, um, the, the usefulness of these types of methods, which are, they're gaining in sort of popularity in, in, in certain, in certain, for certain types of applications with certain types of features. Okay, so I don't have, I, you know, this is like a tutorial, right? So uh, if I wanted to reference everything I was going to say, it would just be a list of references, so I wanted to avoid that. There's a sort of tutorial survey in the Handbook of Graphical Models, uh, which is, came out at the end of last year, which I wrote with Arno Doucet, and a preprint is linked to from my website. It's not on my website, it's on one of the editor's websites, but they have the whole book on, uh, available as a preprint on their website. Okay. Okay, so I'll just start with a bit of classical Monte Carlo. If you don't like the math stuff, then you can kind of hopefully get along with the gist of it. Okay, so the idea of classical Monte Carlo for those of you who are, uh, have seen it before, is you want to approximate sums or integrals with random variables. So again, you, know, you don't need to know what a measurable space is. It's just that the idea is you want to approximate 
some sum or integral that is defined by mu, which may have a density, for example, it might be a probability uh, measure or distribution. Mu of f is just the integral of f with respect to mu. Okay. Okay, so for example, you could consider x to be a finite state space, in which case this is just a sum. So you might imagine that little s is very big. That's why you can't calculate this sum very easily. Um, you could have x being the natural number, so it's just an infinite sum. Or it could have a density, as usual, with respect to the Lebesgue measure on Rd. Okay, and in, in most cases for this talk, we'll look at the case where mu is a, probability is a probability distribution, which basically means that if you integrate the constant function 1, then that is equal to 1, right? Which is the same as saying the density, if you integrate a probability density function, it integrates to 1, or a probability mass function. Okay, and in that case, mu of f is just the expectation of f of x when x is a random variable distributed according to mu. Okay, so some of this is just sort of setting notation. Please ask questions if, if you want to. Okay, so a Monte Carlo approximation of uh, mu of f is obtained by constructing first uh, a sort of random uh, probability measure. Okay, so in this case, what I call mu with a superscript capital N is a random discrete measure, which is basically given by 1 over capital N times the sum of uh, I equals 1 to N of a, of a delta, delta mass at the random variables Z to I, where I haven't made clear that basically the Z to I are all IID distributed according to mu. Okay, sorry. This bit should have been, uh, this, this bit should have been up there. Okay, so it's basically just a random measure that you use to approximate uh, mu of f. And in fact, it's, it's nice in the sense that your approximation of mu of f is actually the integral of f with respect to this random measure, which is supported on these capital N points, which you have drawn according to mu. Okay. So obviously, there are nice things you can say about these types of methods, no matter how you look at them. There's a law of large numbers. There's a strong law, which says that mu n of f converges almost surely to mu of f as capital N goes to infinity, uh, which of course is a nice fundamental justification, but it doesn't really tell you anything about how, how to use these kinds of methods in practice or that it will be successful or useful as an approximation for finite values of capital N. Okay, so of course there are ways, again, like, so the math on this slide is not very, uh, it's not essential. The point is that of course you can look at the accuracy, you can look at the accuracy of such methods and it's actually the accuracy of such methods that drives whether or not they're useful in applications. So in, in this particular case of classical simple Monte Carlo, the variance of mu n of f is exactly 1 over capital N times mu of f bar squared, where f bar is just a centered version of the function. Okay? And it's also an unbiased estimate in this case. Okay, and not only can you see that the variance is decreasing as order 1 over n, you also have a central limit theorem telling you that, your, that your approximation is asymptotically normal in, in the sense described here, which just says that you know, if you rescale mu n of f uh, minus mu of f and you multiply, if you rescale by square root n, then that converges in distribution to a normal with a given variance. Okay, so the good news, of course, is that the, the, the error is uh, of order 1 over square root n, uh, but of course the bad news is that this type of method will, won't work for every type of model that you um, would, might be interested in. And in particular, it doesn't work for the types of hidden Markov models that we will talk about later. Okay. But it's a very simple method, right? So it's a, it's a nice method. You just, instead of uh, trying to do some interesting numerical integration, uh, you just sample some random variables and you evaluate f at all of those random variables and take the average. Okay, so important sampling is a, it's actually basically the same method. Okay? But now let's imagine that we want to approximate pi of f, but we can only simulate random variables distributed according to mu. Okay, so if mu dominates pi in the sense that, say, if pi and mu have densities and pi of x being uh, greater than zero implies mu of x being greater than zero, then we can always rewrite an integral, right, pi of f, as mu of f times w, right, because w uh, in this case will just be the ratio of the densities of pi and mu. Okay, so it's just like multiplication and division by the same thing. Okay, so that's nice. Once you've rewritten your, once you've rewritten your integral uh, pi of f as mu of w times f, then of course you can just use the approximation mu subscript capital N of w times f. 
Okay, and again, the details are not important. You once again get a variance given by a specific expression that is divided by capital N, right? It's also unbiased, and you see that you have an order one over N uh, variance, which goes to zero as N goes to infinity. Okay? <clears throat> so, of course, there are, there are other things. I, I'm, I'm not just trying to go through a catalog of important sampling. Some of the types of expressions that appear here are supposed to set up the notation for what we will look at in the sequential Monte Carlo um, part of the talk. So one thing you might notice is that there are other approximations that people often use in practice or that you could use even based on what I've said before. Instead of just calculating mu n of w times f, I could also calculate this approximation, which is uh, called the self-normalized approximation. I've got mu n of w times f divided by mu n of w, right? So you can see this as a sort of uh, weighted, weighted uh, sum of f of xi, weighted by the weights w of xi, which I also like to write, and oh no, this is good for the sequel, it's good to write it as mu n dot w divided by mu n of w applied to f. So the thing on the, this thing on the very right hand side, you can think of as a sort of weighted uh, empirical measure that you apply to f. Okay? And one way of thinking about it is, you know, if you'd like, you can always think that we're operating on a finite state space, so that mu n is a, is a, is a, is a, basically a vector associated with probabilities associated with one, with the points one to s, and w is just the weight of each of those possible points. So mu n dot f is just the point-wise product, or, or the component-wise product uh, of vectors, right? So it's like reweighting a probability vector by w, and then the division is just reweighting, sorry, is just dividing by the sum of all the weights. Okay, does that make sense? So this is useful in some scenarios. Again, I'm, this is not a talk about important sampling. So this is useful, for example, when W can only be computed up to an unknown normalizing constant, which for those of you familiar with some Bayesian applications is quite common when pi is a posterior distribution. Okay, because maybe you can only compute uh, the density of, of the prior and, 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 the, and the likelihood function. So this type of approximation is biased, but it's still uh, strongly consistent, and it's still asymptotically normal as capital N goes to infinity. There's also a nice, a nice expression for the asymptotic variance, which you don't need to uh, pay much attention to. Okay, but it has a nice asymptotic variance, which can even be better than the, than the standard important sampling asymptotic variance. Often is, even, in many statistical applications. Okay. Okay, so hopefully that's at the scene. Um, the important, I think one of the most important notational things is just the idea of uh, these random measures mu, mu to the capital N applied to a function which is just 1 over N times the sum of that function, right? Okay, and also this idea, well, I don't have a pointer, do I? No, okay. You can use the map. Oh, that's right. So this here, this idea of taking, I, I think it's, it's instructive to think of this on a finite uh, on a finite uh, state space, if you like. This is like taking uh, the random probability distribution associated with points 1 to s as a vector, right, a vector of those probabilities, and just multiplying um, component-wise by w, which are these weights, and then re and then renormalizing. So it's really like you're reweighting a probability distribution. Okay? okay? So now I'll talk about sequential Monte Carlo. And I'll try and keep things heavily motivated by hidden Markov models because, um, well, so it's in. Sorry? Yeah? Why you call it biased? Because of weighted important sampling? Ah, so the self normalized um, important sampling estimate is all, it's just biased in the sense that the expectation of pi n Sn of f is not pi of f. It's pi of f plus something that is order 1 over capital N. So it's still consistent, it's just that it's biased. Yeah. So in some cases, people don't like it for that fact, but you know, it's not always relevant. Is that, yeah? Okay, how many people here have looked at hidden Markov models before? Yeah? Okay, good. Okay, so hopefully this type of, um, uh, these things are somewhat familiar. The idea in a hidden Markov model is that you have two sets of random variables. So you have x1 up to x, x little n. That's just a Markov chain, probably, um, and it's possibly inhomogeneous. 
So it's a Markov chain with an initial distribution mu. So x1 is distributed according to mu. And for each uh, value of p and 2 to n, xp given xp minus 1 comes from a Markov transition kernel indexed by p, so mp. OK, so that's nice. x by itself is just a Markov chain. And then at each time p from 1 to n, the, the conditional distribution of yp uh, given all of the random variables is, is just given by uh, the, uh, its conditional distribution given xp, which comes from something that we just denote g of xp. Uh, that, that denotes the density, say, of yp. OK? So in a graphical model, you would look at it like this. And hopefully that's not too surprising. OK, so you might wonder, well, why do people care about these models? Uh, there's lots of examples. In economics, people would use this to try and model asset prices, which are the y's, uh, did I say? Oh, yeah, so I, one thing I should notice is that in an HMM, the reason this is called a hidden Markov model is because the idea is that the data that you will observe from a statistical perspective, right, is, is observed realizations of the y1, y2, and yn. You never observe x1, x2, and so on. But that's part of the model. So obviously, if you don't observe the x1 up to xn, then the y's are not independent, right? They're, they're conditionally independent given the x's. But if you don't see the x's, it becomes a bit complicated to try and understand um, you know, how likely is certain values of the y's, for example. OK, so examples. So in economics, you might look at the y's as sort of asset prices, but they're driven by some, some process that you don't get to observe the whole process, right? In chemistry, it can govern um, you, you, the y's could be seeing that certain types of reactions have occurred when lots of chemicals uh, are, are present in some mixture in various concentrations, right? In physics, you have imperfect measurements of some dynamical system. Robotics, uh, you're trying to localize in space through some noisy observations of your environment, right? So the y's would be become some kind of sensor observations of your environment, and you're trying to infer where you are because you've got a map. OK, and maybe in ecology, you have sparse observations of some animals in space and time, and you want to know how big is the population of animals, or where are they going, or what is their behavior, and so on, right? Because what is their behavior, where are they going, that's sort of part of the dynamics of the hidden process that you don't get to see. You only get to see that a tiger appeared you know, in this part of the jungle on that day, and then a different tiger appeared in that part of the jungle, and so on. OK, so environment noisier partial observations of climate. And essentially, I mean, the idea is you can think of lots of possible applications. They won't all be easy to, 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 to solve, but uh, any discreetly and partially observed Markov process, right? Because what happens in a discreetly observed Markov process is you observe uh, values of, um, well, you observe data at specific times. And because it's partially observed, it means that you don't observe everything that would, en that would enable you to see the whole Markov process, right? So you have this hidden aspect for your model. OK. So in the context of sequential Monte Carlo, or things that we might be interested in in HMMs that sequential Monte Carlo will help us get a, get a handle on, is we, we may be interested in things that we will denote always by e to p, e to hat p, and z p. OK, so e to p is the distribution of xp given the observations up to time p minus 1. So we often call this the, this is the, the predictive distribution, OK? E to hat p is the distribution of xp given the observations up to time p. So it's the filtering distribution, OK? Or it's typically called the filtering distribution. And the difference is only that the filtering distribution incorporates the observation at time p as well. OK, and zp is the marginal likelihood associated with y1 up to yp. OK, so if those things look funny, then many people like this type of notation using probability density functions on a sort of joint space. So you can think of e to p of xp as you know, the conditional density of xp given y1 up to p minus 1. e to hat p of xp is the conditional density of, of xp given y1 to p. And zp is the, the, basically the, the probability density of y1 up to yp. Okay, and I'm not going to go into the details in this talk for sure, but the reason why you might be interested in ZP is that if you had possibly different parameters associated, if you had statistical parameters associated with your hidden Markov model, then obviously this as a function of theta would be your likelihood function for trying to infer possible values of, of those statistical parameters. Okay, 
But the first thing that's worth noting is it's not at all obvious how to calculate these types of quantities when you have a hidden Markov model, okay, on a general state space. Okay, but so just to simplify notation, instead of writing G of X, Y, P all the time, um, I'll just write capital GP of X. Okay, but the, the idea is that you should always be aware, at least when I talk about hidden Markov models, that the YP is hidden implicitly in this function capital GP. Okay? So, it, so the, it's implicit the dependence on Y1 to YN, but the idea is that in statistics the data is fixed. So we fix the data and we want to infer conditional distributions for XP or the marginal likelihood associated with that data. Okay, so this is the, the, probably the worst slide, uh, but it just tries to establish uh, the things on the right-hand side which are gonna enable us to define something that many of you already know, which is just the forward algorithm for doing inference in hidden Markov models. Okay, so on the top line, we just noticed that eta one, which is the predictive distribution at time one, is exactly the same as the initial distribution, which we could also use in our common notation as f of x one, okay? So, the sort of filtering distribution at time one is the conditional dis distribution of x1 given y1, so its density, if you like, is given by uh, Bayes' rule, which is just f of x1, f of y1 given x1, uh, divided by f of y1, okay? And one nice way of rewriting this in terms of eta's and g's is eta1 dot g1, so you reweight your initial distribution by your observation densities at time one, g1, and you renormalize. Okay, so it's just uh, reweighting and uh, renormalizing. And similarly, for each time p from two to n, you get sort of something quite similar. E to p of xp is the, uh, is the predictive distribution of xp given y1 to p minus one, which you can think of as e to p minus one uh, mutated by mp of xp. Okay, and on the finite, in a finite state space setting, this e to p minus one mp is literally a row vector times a matrix, right? It's a vector matrix multiplication. Okay? And the rest is exactly the same as before. E to hat P of XP, you obtain by taking the predictive distribution, reweighting by the observation at time P, renormalizing, and then looking at its density. Okay, does that make sense? So, the, I mean, it doesn't matter what's in the middle. What matters is the stuff on the left and the right. Okay? The stuff in the middle is just, you know, hopefully makes sense for those who like it. Okay, and similarly, you can look at the marginal likelihood. So ZP is the, is the density of uh, Y1 to P, which you can always decompose as the density of Y1 to P minus one multiplied by the conditional density of YP given one to P minus one, which is exactly the same as just saying this is ZP minus one times E to P of GP, right? It's the, it's the predictive, uh, it's the integral of the predictive um, it's the integral of the observation density at time p with respect to the predictive distribution at time p minus one, okay? Okay, so that's, that's what's important, is just to map the things on the left to the things on the right, because what it means is that actually to implement the forward algorithm for a finite state space, say, hidden Markov model, you just need to do this sequence of steps, right? You set eta one to be mu, you set z one to be eta one of g one, Right, that's the, that's the integral of G1 with respect to E1, or the sum of G1 with respect to E1. And then you reweight E1 by G1 to get E hat 1. And for all the subsequent times, P is equal to 2 to N, you do a matrix multiplication, a vector matrix multiplication. You do an update of your marginal likelihood, you know, given the previous uh, mar marginal likelihood at the previous time. And you also reweight E to P by GP to give you E to hat P. Okay, so it's always the same type of operations through time. And this is exactly the forward algorithm, okay? And you might wonder, why am I talking about the forward algorithm? I'm talking about the forward algorithm because in SMC, all you do is you implement like a, a kind of strange perturbation of the forward algorithm, right? It's a very simple, it's a very simple procedure that you, that you try and do. You might even think that it's very naive, and maybe it is very naive, but it's actually got some very nice properties. Okay, so things you might notice is that if you weren't on a finite state space, obviously this algorithm doesn't make much sense because you can't, you can't implement it on a computer. So for example, 
I can't represent mu on a computer if mu is a, just a distribution or general state space. I can't evaluate e to 1 of g1 and so on. I can't, I can't reweight e to 1 to give me e to hat 1. None of those operations make sense, okay? But something that does make sense is if I was to replace e to 1, right, with a, with a random probability measure consisting of capital N points, that makes it sort of a finite probability measure, right? So I can just do the operations that I would have done if, if, that was, if, if, if I was on a finite state space with my random probability measure, so my random distributions or empirical distributions, whichever you like. Okay, so one of the key steps is, is up here. Because we can't, we, can't, we can't get a handle on e to 1, what we, end, what we instead do is we sample capital N uh, random variables, zeta 1 i, for i is one, in 1 to n. I sample them i id from mu, which is the same as e to 1, and I set my approximation of e to 1 to be just this uh, empirical measure, okay, which is nice. My z1, my, my approximation of z1 is just the integral of g1 with respect to my random empirical measure, but of course I can compute that because there's only n points, capital N points. Okay, and I can similarly reweight e to 1 capital N, my approximation of e to 1 by g1 because again, I only have capital N points. It's just a vector if you like, okay? And then, so that's kind of the basic idea. The only complication now is this, this funny step where obviously even if I know, even, even if even if I have a handle on e to hat p minus 1 capital N, which is a random approximation I obtain from the previous time, like at time 2, that's just e to hat 1 of N. Even if that's finite, MP is a general state space Markov kernel, right? So I can't get a handle on this because this is a complicated distribution, right? But what I can do is I can sample capital N times and independently uh, random variable z to pi from this distribution, which is given by this expression, expression here, and I can use that as my approximation of e to p, right, as my random probability distribution approximation of e to p. Okay, I think it's, some people might think it looks naive, I think it looks very nice, because it's nice and simple, and then your, z to, your approximation of z to p is just, uh, the integral of GP with respect to your random distribution e to pn, and you update just as the same as you updated e to hat one. Okay? So some people think SMC is a complicated algorithm. It's like a one-step algorithm. I mean, except for the first step, all you ever do is this. Okay. Okay, so it also has a nice evolutionary algorithm interpretation, which is actually helpful in terms of how you implement it and sometimes also how you can visualize it. So obviously, you, this, this, this step of simulating even one random variable from this, uh, from, this, from this distribution, it actually is like a mixture distribution, right? It's like a mixture where the weights are given by the gp minus 1, uh, z to p minus 1j, and then the sort of uh, distributions associated with the mixture are these, uh, um, the conditional distribution of something given by the Markov kernel at the associated point. Okay, so obviously sampling n times from this distribution would naively incur a cost of order n squared, but that's not how you do it. You sample, um, when you actually implement this algorithm, what you typically do, I'm not gonna get into the details, is you efficiently sample capital N times from a categorical distribution given by the gp minus ones um, of associated with each of the particles, and you can think of those ap minus one i's as the ancestors of uh, z to p i in the specific sense that in stage two, when you actually simulate z to p i, you simulate, oh, there's a typo there, you simulate it from m p of z to p minus one, a p minus one i, and there should be a comma and a dot, okay? So really you can think of a p minus one i as the index of the ancestor of z to p i. I'm sorry for the notation, I mean there's just always gonna be indices everywhere when you talk about sequential Monte Carlo. Okay, so some of those details you don't need to know um, or remember, the main thing is that somehow, if you think about this algorithm or sampling from this type of uh, procedure over time, you can think of g p minus one as like a fitness function, which helps you determine how, uh, which particles have how many offspring, okay, or which particles are the ancestors of how many particles, okay, and m p is just a mutation kernel. That's one way of thinking about it. 
Okay? And I'll have a picture on the next slide, but the idea is of this is not that you can write down the code. The idea is that the code is very simple, right? The code for this algorithm in a very general setting is very simple. The only modification here is that the states are sort of um, assumed to be univariate, so, so it's a little bit more efficient in R. Okay, so the important bits here are you just sample all your zetas from some distribution, capital N of them from mu. Your weights are always given by some capital G function, and your um, the log of Z, it's always good to work in the logs for numerical reasons, it's just the log of the mean of the, of the values of G at all of the points, which have been computed on the previous slide. Okay? And then the main, the main part of the algorithm, I don't want to go into much detail, is just basically four lines. Okay? And this is like every SMC algorithm. You just have to supply the M function, the G function, you know, the number of particles, capital N, and the length of the time series. Okay? So, of course, I think the slides will be available, so you could look at them if you want on your own time. If you look at a particle system evolving over time, what you get is a bunch of uh, these particles distributed according to mu, right, at, at time one. And then at time two, where did that move? At time two, you have red lines showing, you know, which, which particle at time one is the ancestor of each of the particles at, at time two. Each particle should have exactly one ancestor. It's just that here, there's two particles very close together. Okay. Okay, and you can see at time three, there's more, and I can play it, right? So over time, you just have these evolutionary sort of system where every particle has exactly one ancestor. There's, there's a few particles that are overlapping, which makes it look like there are particles with more than one ancestor, but that's not the case. They all have one ancestor. Okay, and if, if you like, you can actually, I can tell you that the mu in this case was just a standard normal. The mutations are sort of, uh, they're just a sort of random walk in the state space, uh, but the g's actually sort of force the particles to be closer to zero. They're higher, you know, the, 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 the g function uh, makes it so that the particles are more likely to be close, close to zero. So in fact, if you didn't have the selection, you would see these particles wandering off, you know, quite far away from zero, but, but because of the selection, they, they stay quite close to zero. Okay? That's one way of looking at it. Okay? And this is not going to be a theoretical talk, so I don't want to go into too much detail on the theory, but I'll just tell you why some people like this type of algorithm. This is the only really theoretical slide in the whole talk. Okay? So let's just assume, for example, that all of the g's and f, say, are bounded where f is an arbitrary function. Um, continuous, say. There, there, are some nice, there are some nice properties of this algorithm which maybe belie its simplicity as just sort of replacing uh, distributions we wish we knew with random approximations. Okay, so one is that uh, the expectation of the estimate uh, of Zn is exactly Zn, which is a little bit surprising and quite useful in, 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 in some cases, but I won't talk about them today. As usual, you have a law of large numbers which just say that basically as capital N increases, you can expect um, the approximation to get better and better. You have asymptotic normality, which people like. They have a good handle on the distribution of the error, at least in theory. But these last two are somehow more interesting, especially when you want to compare them with sort of other sort of Monte Carlo approximations, which I won't go into detail on today just because of time, which is that under some special assumption, certainly not, not for every type of model you might think of, under special assumptions, you have these kind of results, which say um, that your approximation of the predictive distribution at time little n is basically very good, and it's given by some, uh, the sort of L2 error is less than or equal to some error associated with f divided by square root n, no matter what the value of little n is, right? There's no, there's no sort of accumulation of error over time that tells you that your error will get worse and worse. Okay, so this is called time uniform convergence, and it's one of the main theoretical results which really sort of um, let people understand why these methods can be so useful in hidden Markov models under some special assumptions. And, similar, and, and, and in, in similar, um, or under very similar assumptions, often exactly the same, you can also show that the unbiased estimate of Zn also has a variance which grows you might think that this means that it grows exponentially in little n, which it does, but actually what it means is that if you were to scale k 
capital N with little n, then actually you, you can control the variance, right? It's exponential of C divided by whatever scaling you used for capital N. Okay? Because that's, that's it for theory. The theory just suggests that it's quite good. And of course, you can, you can, extend, uh, you can extend some of the things I've talked about to, uh, to sort of smoothing distributions, if you'd like, which is to say you can define a measure in the, in the following way, which instead of basically keeping on integrating the m's and the g's, you actually define in a measure on the state space uh, from, of x1 to n. And in an HMM, you can think of this type of measure as having the density, the joint density of um, x0 to n, sorry, 1 to n, and y1 to n minus 1. Okay, that should be a 1, not a 0. Okay, so that's a joint density. That's not a probability density for x, but of course, this, this, this density, uh, you can always renormalize so that it is the conditional distribution of x1 to n given y1 to n minus 1, which is kind of like a, a version of a smoothing distribution. So I don't want to get into the details on how you do that, but I will show you a picture instead of how you might think about this. Okay, the idea is that you run your algorithm and you actually use the kind of genealogical information or the ancestral information to form an approximation of, of the smoothing distribution um, or, or expectations with respect to that, this particular smoothing distribution at time little n. Okay, so it looks like this. It involves uh, multiple multiplication by a normalizing constant estimate, but then after that, just taking the average of f applied to all these paths. Okay? If you like, you can also omit the zn, and then you have a biased estimate or something. But basically, the story is you can also do smoothing if you use these types of estimates. This is one way to do smoothing, a simple way to do smoothing. And if you want to have a look, you can see, well, what happens from an ancestral or genealogical perspective is that you run your algorithm up to time 10, and then the red lines are, as before, just the lines connecting particles with their ancestors at the previous time, but the blue lines are the particles and, and their ancestry at time 10, right? So at time 10, uh, what you can see is basically, obviously all of their ancestors uh, have a blue line going to them, but after that, what you see is that actually their most of, or all of those particles only have one time one ancestor, okay? But this is what you expect from a genealogical kind of tree, right? That, that um, evolves in exactly this kind of way, okay? But this is what happens with 16 particles. And what you can infer is that obviously, if you were trying to calculate an expectation with respect to the smoothing distribution at time little n, if n is 10 and you're using 16 particles in this system, it's probably not gonna be very good because you only have one point basically at, at, at the earlier times. But if you increase, there are a number of particles to 256, so capital N 256, then what you can see is there's a lot more diversity and you actually have lots of paths going back in time. Okay? So basically more particles are better. That's, that's the idea. Obviously I'm not gonna go into the quantitative um, aspects of how to, how to control the number of alive, uh, um, well, the number of time one particles that have existing descendants at time little n. Okay. So I have a bit of time to get, a, I, I don't want to get into too many details, but obviously it's a good thing to talk about maybe how people use SMC uh, in other situations and not just hidden Markov models because they're not restricted to those kinds of settings. Um, and indeed, if you've, if you've, uh, you may have noticed from what I said earlier is that actually the algorithm is just defined in terms of the m's and the g's and mu, right? That's the only ingredients to the algorithm is mu, m's, and g's, which if you think about it from an, from an evolutionary perspective, you just have an initial distribution, you have a bunch of ways to mutate particles, and you have a bunch of ways of assessing their fitness. And using, um, by assessing their fitness, you determine which particles have offspring, right? Or which particles are mutated to produce the next generation. Okay, and in fact, the, the relationship between e to p and e to p minus one and gp minus one and mp is exactly just given by this, this one equation, right? This is like a flow of, uh, a flow of probability distributions over time determined by a fitness function, a mutation function, right? 
So you can think of it as a function of the previous, uh, you can think of it here as just some map that maps the probability distribution at time p minus one to a probability distribution at time p. Okay, so at, at a very sort of high level, you can imagine, well, this kind of flow of probability distributions is maybe gonna be useful for approximating pi of f for an arbitrary pi, maybe nothing to do with a hidden Markov model, if I have a sort of generic way of constructing a flow from mu to pi, where mu is some, some easy to sample from distribution. Okay, and one of the points that I wanted to make for this talk, and you don't need to necessarily get into all the details, is that it's very simple to design such a flow. It's trivial to design such a flow, okay? So you define uh, some mu, which is gonna be equal to eta one, as always, and they should, um, so eta one should dominate eta two, which should dominate eta three, and so on, uh, which should dominate eta n, which should be equal to pi. Okay, so you just define them directly, and then I will show you a way to define the g's and the n's so that the flow is valid. Okay, so all you do is you let g p minus one uh, be proportional to the, the ratio of densities of e to p and e to p minus one, okay? Same as like in important sampling. It's like, it's like the weight function in, in important sampling. And then you let each Markov kernel, or the Markov kernel at time p, be an, be an e to p invariant Markov kernel, which you might, you, or you would often construct using your favorite Markov chain Monte Carlo method like the Metropolis-Hastings algorithm or Gibbs sampler or whatever, okay? So then you just need to check, well, indeed, if I take e to p minus one and I reweight it by g p minus one, well, that's gonna give me e to p, right? And if I look at this integral, if, well, e to p minus one integrating this is exactly one, right? Because it's the integral of an importance distribution uh, with respect to e to p minus one. Okay, so you just get this. So this is gonna be e to p uh, moved by the Markov kernel MP, right? Which of course is just gonna be exactly equal to e to p because that's how you designed these Markov kernels. Okay, so the flow is fine. Okay, so this type of idea, I don't wanna to get too much in history, but it, it was, um, I think, proposed first by Gilks and Berzuini, but also then later, um, promoted more widely in, an SM, in a paper called SMC Samplers, okay? So in practice, you can, you can easily come up with schemes whereby you, you, you construct your individual eta distributions using a type of tempering scheme. I don't wanna get too much in the, into the details, but you choose some mu, say, that is uh, very diffuse, and then you gradually temper it so it looks more and more like pi and less and less like mu, okay? And people like to do this for multimodal uh, distributions pi. Okay, and it's, there are many open research questions about how you should do the tempering, right? Because it's quite computationally uh, difficult. Okay, so another, another kind of thing that you can do which follows on from what I just said is that, well, once you start thinking about uh, SMC algorithms as operating on flows, right? Well, you can also ask yourself, well, what's a good flow and what's a bad flow? Right, what kind of flow? Obviously all the flows, they just have to do with the flow of distributions. So if you just look at the distributions, that's, that, you know, there's nothing to choose between them. The issue when you talk about a, a good flow is whether or not the particle approximation of that flow will be close to, or give you something at, 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 the, at the terminal time, middle end, give you something that is close to what you actually want, right? Is the Monte Carlo estimate gonna actually be close to the real answer, okay? So that's what I mean by good. And of course, once you have that in mind, you can imagine, well, there are definitely good flows and there are definitely bad flows, okay? So one thing you can do with a flow, if you already have a flow, is you can twist it, right? You can change, you can change it a little bit and you can hope that it will be better. Okay, so I'll just give you one example of one way that you can do it, just very generally. Again, you don't need to focus on, on, on these expressions. The main point is, you know, they're quite easy to write down. The idea is that instead of sampling from mu, you'll sample from something called mu psi, which is just mu reweighted by a positive function psi one, right? And then renormalized. And then your potential function g1, it's a little bit complicated. It's just the normal g1 that you would have used, but you now multiply it by the integral of psi two with respect to the Markov transition m2 at x. That's a little bit complicated, but 
you know, you just, you, you have to reweight it by something and then divide it by psi one and multiply by mu of psi one. Okay, so it doesn't really matter the exact details, at least for just, you know, just for this talk, right? But the point is that you can, you can in, a, in a mechanistic way, just twist a flow by defining a sequence of positive functions psi one up to psi n. So for the next times, all you do is you end up, you, you twist your Markov kernel uh, by the positive function psi p at time p. Okay, and your potential function, or these g functions, sorry, these g functions are similarly slightly, slightly changed. Okay, and actually if you do this, it's not too difficult to deduce that actually e to p psi, which is the, the, which is the, the distribution associated with the, twisted, um, with the twisted model, is basically just proportional to e to p uh, multiplied by psi p. Okay? So it may seem weird, right? But uh, you know, it may be not obvious that this is actually going anywhere or that this is useful. But actually, you, if you actually twist the flow in a, in a, in a really good way, um, then you can have an approximation, for example, of Zn that has no variance at all. So it's a perfect approximation, basically, because you just calculate. Okay, so in this case, um, abstractly, you're just saying psi p of x is g p of x multiplied by the expected value of psi p plus 1 when you move x by m p plus 1. That's what that says. Obviously, it's usually easier to think of this maybe in the HMM setting. So in the HMM setting, this just says well, psi p of xp is exactly just the conditional density of yp to n given xp. Okay, which in some sense is saying particles may be, instead of normally weighting them the way you do for the simple application of SMC to hidden Markov models, you normally weight them by the observation density at time p, right? Um, instead, you should weight them by how well they explain the whole future, in, you know, instead of just, just the present. Which also lets you know that obviously when I talk about these optimal twisting functions, you can only apply them in an offline setting. You can't apply them in an in a online filtering setting, if you like. But there are many offline settings of interest. Okay, so obviously in, in practice, um, this is certainly not, not the only time people have known that, you know, if you could evaluate densities such as this one, you could construct a really good particle filter. The point is that somehow, even though you probably couldn't use this sequence of optimal functions, you can use any approximation, and you're not, you're not uh, introducing any bias that you can't uh, get rid of, okay? So you can use any reasonable approximation, if, and in some cases, people have previously used versions of this algorithm, but not within this framework. So I don't know if, how many people are familiar, but you know, if you use psi p to be gp, then that is a well-known uh, algorithm from, uh, a long time ago, like 20 years ago at least. Okay. Okay. Obviously, if you use psi p to just be constant functions, then you haven't done anything. Okay. Okay, so just for the very final bit, it's mainly pictures. Okay, I'll just define a simple approximation and then show you some pictures. Uh, the main point for me is that somehow you've got SMC algorithms. This talk even included some code on how to implement a simple SMC algorithm. Um, there's also lots of theory because this algorithm is quite, is, it's quite a celebrated theory in, in some contexts, right? So um, it's quite a celebrated algorithm in some contexts, so lots of people have tried to study it. Okay, so especially for unbiased, unnormalized approximations, which I kind of alluded to slightly before, there are lots of things that you can say about how, how, how accurate they are, but actually in practice, Knowing really well theoretically how those algorithms behave does not actually help you in individual instances when you want to know how accurate your approximation has been for the thing you're trying to approximate. Okay, and it turns out that actually um, it's possible to try and get a good estimate of the variance of various unbiased estimates associated with these SMC approximations by actually um, looking at the genealogy of the particles. Okay. And in particular, if you consider, for, for, for one of the simple estimates, you're, all you're doing is you're considering the Eve indices of each particle. And if you talk about the Eve index, you mean, you know, the, the Eve index just refers to the time one ancestor of each particle. Okay, so again, this is a kind of similar plot, except I don't plot the locations of the particles, I just plot their, the, their, their indices. You can see that 
Um, the E indices of the particle at time 10 are just given by those three, those three particles. Okay, there's only three E's that have, uh, that have, that have descendants at time 10. Okay, so you don't need to pay much attention to the estimate. In particular, there's a simple estimate for uh, the relative variance of Zn minus 1 capital N. If you want other values, you can, you know, we, we can also get them, but this is probably the simplest. You're looking at some, some kind of estimate or estimator that's just 1 minus something to do with capital N, which is the number of particles, little n, which is the number of, or the length of your sequential Monte Carlo model, and then this term which is 1 minus 1 over n squared times the sum of the squared values of the number of particles in each, um, the number of particles with the same eth. Okay, so you kind of, it's like you clump particles by who their time one ancestor is, and you sum the square of the sizes of those groups. Okay? So again, I mean, you're not gonna, it's hard to get really good intuition just looking at one expression, but there are various things you can see. Like, for example, um, if, for all particles, they have the same eve, which is like the degenerate situation when you didn't have enough particles, maybe, then you can see that this estimator is always one. Okay. So that's also the maximum value you can have. Okay, but if you look at other things, for example, you can see that you have a lack of bias for certain types of, uh, certain types of properties, certain types of random variables, which may or may not be intuitively reasonable. But you also have things like this, which is that you have consistency in the sense that if you multiply your estimator by capital N, that converges in probability to the asymptotic variance or the asymptotic relative variance of the actual thing you're interested in. Okay, so again, not, you know, the math isn't necessarily interesting. It's very easy to implement this particular simple estimate that I just showed you. It just in involves recursively updating what the Eve indices for each particle is, are, Okay, and then computing basically that thing that I mentioned, uh, computing that expression. And then I'll just show you a picture maybe of, you know, oh no, I actually implemented, I ran the code very slightly. It just tells you what you would expect, which is that you do have a lack of bias. You do have, say, a variance, an, a sample variance of the, of, of the output is 0 0.03. Uh, this is the actual estimator unbiased estimate of the relative variance, which is 0 0.027. You actually usually can't implement this, right? But you can, you can just take the mean of the Vs, which is the simple thing that you can definitely implement, and you get something like 0 0.27, which is very close and quite accurate in this case. Okay, and just to remind you that basically this is one realization of, uh, this is one realization of the variance estimate, and this is the corresponding sort of uh, ancestral lines that tell you which particles, well, it doesn't tell you because you can't probably tell from this picture, but basically all of the information is in the blue lines, right? Like which particles are grouped together, okay? Okay, so that's it. This is the final slide, which just says, obviously I've gone through a few things. SMC is useful for approximating integrals with a particular structure. I didn't want to get into too much detail about exactly all of the uh, ways to define that structure. Um, but there are quite good resources online available as well. And of course, there's the tutorial survey that I mentioned at the beginning that you can look at if you're interested. So it's very computationally efficient in some scenarios, not all. Uh, for example, time uniform convergence is sort of a, a highlight sort of property <coughs> for very, very um, amenable problems. Okay, and with the stuff with the flows was just to say you can transform some complex high dimensional integral into an integral with the structure that you talk about by sort of transforming it into flows and then seeing how f you, can, you can represent these flows using g's and n's, right? The, the fitness functions and the mutation functions. Okay, and things that I didn't cover were how you can actually use this type of algorithm to infer parameters of an HMM. It's highly related. You just basically run this algorithm within a Markov chain Monte Carlo scheme. That's been so far like the only way we have to infer parameters in some general settings. I haven't covered some more interesting smoothing algorithms than just tracing the ancestries of your particles at time little n. And I definitely didn't talk about some more refined theoretical results that give you a stronger handle on how these things really behave um, in fi with finite samples. 
Okay. So there are, sorry? Any R factors? In R, I mean, there's an old one, I think, on R that claims to do it. I haven't used it. Um, I have a package implemented in Julia, which does it, but you might not use Julia. Um, do you know of any in R? I don't think that there's a very recent one, so I wouldn't have some of the more recent, recent methods. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, that's right. That's with Adam Johansson yeah. and Dirk Edelbutel and yeah. In our interface, or is it you have to write the flows in C? I've never used it. Yeah, I think you have to write the yeah. I think unfortunately, for efficiency reasons in R, you typically need to write things in C++, which is why when I wrote a FNC package, it's in Julia, because it's. It doesn't suffer from exactly the same problems, but it suffers from the fact that it's not R. <laughs> so, yeah. Oh, for self-normalized important sampling. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. 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 And then on page 19, So only only Zn, well not only Zn, but only things like Zn. The approximation of Zn are unbiased, but the approximation, say, eta little n capital n of f, that would be biased, except at time one. And eta hat n little n of capital n of f, which is a reweighted version of eta n, that is also biased. But basically, almost everything is biased except this type of quantity or other types of unnormalized um, quantity. Uh, there's, I don't think there's a proof that is shorter than a page. So, I, I mean, the, I think the main intuition is that when you deal with the unnormalized quantities, you don't actually end up, well, no, it's, it's not a good intuition. That's just, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> It's just a chapter in the book, but yeah. Oh, okay. one, one chapter with the tutorial part. Yeah. Could you just put the title of that uh, book up again? Ah, uh, yeah, sure. Here. And that's the question for you. Can you use the EMS estimator that you used to get the variance of the normalized constant as a diagnostic tool? Like to say, Yeah, so one is yeah, so one is the upper limit and one tells you it could be quite it could be really bad. It doesn't mean that the estimate is probably having a the estimator has a variance of approximately one. Yeah. So if you want to use it as a diagnostic, you'd have to use something like zero point five or lower. Is that written anywhere? Is that your intuition? Well no, I mean it's but it's just a diagnostic. It's, it's hard to prove exactly what it would mean. It would be interesting for someone to prove that if the estimator was less than X that you would have a relative variance of less than y with certain probability under certain assumptions. Yeah. That would be interesting. Let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We can try. I mean, th there would th there definitely need to be assumptions. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So when does this break? The sequential Monte Carlo methods. Yeah. 
Yeah, so I think one of the interesting things, so I didn't want to dwell on it, but one of the interesting things about these estimators of variance is they also tell you something. Some of them are unbiased estimators of the variance, and they're constrained in various ways. And what they tell you is that actually, when all of your particles have the same eve, then that's bad in terms of estimating certain quantities. Not all quantities, but certain quantities are definitely going to be very variable, right? So that sort of gives you a, theor a theoretical way to also say that what people have seen empirically for a number of years is true, which is that if the weights are too variable, then you end up uh, having many particles that have zero offspring. And if that happens too many times, or the weights are really too variable, then you end up with only one Eve uh, responsible at a later time, and things definitely don't work. So that's one way of just looking at the algorithm saying it doesn't work if you end up with a very depleted set of time one particles with descendants at, at, at the terminal time. But you can also see, well, what makes the weights very variable? Well, certainly in high dimensions, when you have high dimensional state space models or hidden Markov models, that typically leads to very variable weights, right? There are ways to try and um, mitigate that by twisting, for example. That can help sometimes, not always. Um, or when you have just very observe, uh, when you have very informative observations, which is a bit like being in high dimensional spaces, um, then your weights tend to be very variable and the particle filter collapses, right? It's usually people say the particle filter collapses or the SMT algorithm collapses when you have only one Eve particle. So it, does that help at all? Yeah. 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 And maybe also when your model is misspecified. So it's also true that in many cases if you use a misspecified model and it's a hidden Markov model and you use the mutations and the, and the weights that are associated with the, the transitions and the observation densities of that model, then yes, typically that will mean that your particle filter will collapse quicker, right? Obviously, if you ever fix little n and you take capital N to infinity, things are good, right? But that's a bit uh, idealistic. Yeah. Is there the degeneration problem? Yeah, yeah, so exactly. The, the, the degeneracy is when you have one Eve particle.